Well, we're moving on to the Gospel of Luke, and so why, you might ask, are we looking at a slide about Matthew? Well, let me just tack on to the end. It would have been better to have all this wrapped up in the study Wednesday, so it would all be on that video when we finish studying our introduction to, in this series, Introduction to the Gospels. That was a 10-part series at, on an introduction to Matthew. And we're moving on to Luke, but I wanted to include some of the sources and let you know these are the sources I use to put together that material that I presented to you. And uh, I think you might be interested in some of these, and I'll try to give you uh, some recommendations even in addition to the ones that I mainly use for the class. I've mentioned to you several times, and I'm going to uh, again be referring to Mark Strauss's book, Four Portraits, One Jesus. And this has some scholarly material in it, but also much of it is written on a popular level, and even the scholarly material is accessible to, to the, um, I guess, what, what would we say, the layman or to the um, to the average person just wanting a better understanding of these uh, of the Gospels. The book by Powell, Mark Allen Powell, Introduction to the Gospels, is a text used in some seminaries and Christian colleges. And I found that uh, quite by accident. I hadn't heard about it, and I absolutely love it. It is uh, much more brief than Strauss's work. But he brings to light a lot of things that I didn't uh, uh, find in Strauss. And so I end up going back and forth quite a bit on that synoptic problem that we talked about. There's an excellent book. And again, this might be more than some want to study. But the three views, have you ever heard of the three views or the four views books? There's a whole series of them, like four views on the end times, four views on the book of Revelation, four views on this, on that. Well, this is one on the origin of the, of the synoptics. The Cradle, the Cross, and the Crown, edited by Kirstenberger and others. Uh, whoops, I advanced here, but nothing happened up there. Uh, Are you going to put all that in the box? Yeah, yes, that will be posted. It's not posted yet. Um, <laughs> we're back to Bob. Um, let's see why. Okay, the, and, and in fact, uh, let me do this. Chelsea, could you kill the lights over there, or just the front two, the front two banks? Um, and it, the Cradle, the Cross, and, and the Crown, edited by Kirstenberger and others, is uh, a huge work that is a, a major introduction to the New Testament, and it will take you through a lot of the basic areas that you cover when you're, when you're introducing either, in this case, the New Testament, but there are common areas when you introduce the older New Testament that you address, and then there are unique areas just to New Testament introduction. But then they have an introduction to the Gospels, how to read the Gospels. I referred to this earlier when we gave some principles of, interpret uh, of, of interpretation for the Gospels at the very end before we started Matthew of the introduction. And um, then a section on each gospel and on each book of the New Testament. This is a good work I'd highly recommend. The Van Hooser book is, uh, is scholarly and perhaps a little bit tedious uh, maybe to those who are not looking for a more academic treatment of the gospels, but this uh, theological interpretation of the New Testament also will give you a really good uh, perspective on each of the New Testament books. Now, for, for Matthew, Garland is a well-known commentator, has some great material. His introduction to Matthew in his book, Reading Matthew, uh, I didn't draw a whole lot from it, but it was useful to me for a couple of key thoughts that I didn't find anywhere else. This is why it's important a lot of times if you're really studying something in depth to use different sources, just like different teachers you've had in Bible class and different preachers you've heard will bring out different things from the text. It's the same way with uh, commentators. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of the world-renowned Bible scholars, 
Carson, D.A. Carson and Douglas Moo, I love their materials. They uh, are well known in the area of biblical academics and this introduction to the New Testament has some, uh, some good stuff. But now on a more popular level, now just for if you're just wanting to study at home or even if you're teaching a Bible class or if you're homeschooling or wh whatever, the, whatever case might be, you just wanted to do some study. This Encountering the New Testament by Elwell and Yarbrough is on a more popular level and it's much more accessible. I'd recommend that and I also highly recommend the ESV Study Bible. I know the print in it is tiny. If Ah, see, Samuel's holding up that same cover, right? That same copy. And uh, you have to have a dolly to carry it around with you. It uh, weighs about 48 pounds, uh, right? It's ginormous. It's a massive book, and the print is really small. And I have it uh, in, on my iPad, and you can make the text as large as you want. See, and that's the Lord's way of showing you it's time to switch from your print Bible to, uh, to a digital Bible on an iPad. I can't get my wife to switch. She wants, her, she wants her print and paper, right, like Olivia does her Bible. I understand that. There's something about that visceral, that uh, tactile experience of turning a page. But, no and you don't need a battery. But, but you can't read your Bible in the dark while the wife is sleeping next to you in bed this has its own it just lights up there under the covers and I can read it and without without a little flashlight or without a little book light I used to go uh, it the light does bother her but I, I don't care really so but uh, sometimes it yeah it the light bothers her but I, I've gone out on the deck in, in Virginia at night and read my Bible, and I loved being able to have it out there in the light, and it would just draw every mosquito for 800 miles around. You, know, you had to read quickly and get back in the house. Um, yeah, so let me share with you. The ESV Study Bible, though, listen, listen. It has brief introductions to each book. Now, the ESV Bible itself, just the ESV Bible, has a short paragraph introduction to every book. But the ESV Study Bible has a longer introduction to each book. And then it will have key text, all the kinds of things that we're looking at, the, the major areas, the literary features, the major themes, and all of that. And then footnotes, as you go through the text, the notes at the bottom of each page are, are very useful. I always check the ESV Study Bible before I teach a text in class just to, because it will help you touch all the bases and the major points that need to be made. Now, I listen to hours and hours of lectures on the synoptic problem, on introduction to the Gospels in general, and on Matthew in particular, and Yale University has some open courses where you can actually listen in. They've recorded some of the lectures by professors there, and you can listen to them in the podcast form. Some of them are on YouTube, and Dale Martin, Professor Dale Martin has some on the Gospels, and I found um, those to be useful, though we would disagree with uh, many of his views. Obviously, we need to be careful when we're, when we're using sources from those who hold views about uh, the church and salvation and other matters, in particular areas that, that we would not agree with. And in fact, the text, uh, look at this, Russ, the text that is recommended. You brought this up uh, one time after class. The, the assigned text for that course at Yale is Bart Ehrman, The New Testament, Introduction to the Early Christian Writings. And Bart Ehrman is an infamous skeptic who does not believe the biblical documents are accurate. And that's the text you have to read. Uh, uh, he, he's written some book. He wrote, I believe the title of one of his books is Truth and Fiction in the Gospels. And he is a well-known opponent of the historical accuracy of the New Testament. But, uh, the, and there you see, he has, remember I talked earlier when we introduced the Gospels, this, what's called the quest for the historical Jesus. I don't know if you remember that. That was months ago when we were in that part of the study. 
And the great courses, have you ever seen ads for the great courses where you can, you can buy a course and listen to it? It used to be on CD, now you can just stream them right from the website or from the app on your phone. Well, um, Ehrman has a course there as well. I found on YouTube from a Catholic theologian an excellent series on Matthew from Catholic Theological Union. And I thought his, he has a series of nine lectures that I thought were outstanding where he just took the class through. That was a class for college credit, I think, at the graduate level. And that took you through the, the Gospels in a, in a great way. But some of the material that I especially liked, as far as lectures go, were from Luke Timothy Johnson, Jesus, and the Gospels. This is from the Great Courses, it, and it co costs about 50 bucks for this course. But it is so uh, worth it to me. This is what he covers here. I noticed in the comments, I was looking at the comments before I decided to get it, and the different reviews people were making. And now here's the lectures that he gives as he goes through um, the, the Gospels. But uh, someone complained that it took him nine lessons before he got to the Gospel of Mark. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, can you? Uh, because it took us, it took us 14 right? 14. And he goes, I couldn't believe it took him nine lessons before he even got to the Gospel of Mark. This guy was just complaining, and I thought, wow, I don't want you guys writing uh, Google reviews of my class, uh, okay, because I don't know what you'd say. Uh, R.T. France's work in the New International Commentary of the New Testament is a classic commentary. It's, the, I think, the go-to for a lot of people on the Gospel of Matthew, and it's available in the Tyndale series as well. And I'd highly recommend the Pillar New Testament commentary. That one's by Morris. I love some stuff I have by Morris on other books of the New Testament, and his stuff on Matthew is good too. And the NIV application commentary is an excellent commentary I'd highly uh, recommend. I have a, a final quote that I want to cite from that Van Hooser, the Theological Introduction to the New Testament work. But any, any question or comment on sources or anything that I could uh, recommend? Thanks. Michael, you can get that, those two uh, switches if you don't mind. Thank you. Any uh, question about, uh, is there any commentary that any of you particularly like or have used or any works that you found helpful that you can share that with us? Well, listen, Gundry is, uh, has a, I believe, a monumental work on the book of Matthew. And this is what he said here from his chapter on Matthew, some of which was not, I didn't find very helpful, but there were some real uh, nuggets in that that I loved. But he said uh, about Matthew sort of assessing the whole thing at the end of his material, wherever the church has grown large and mixed, wherever the church is polarized between the extremes of latitudinarianism and sectarianism. And there he means, remember we were talking about how Matthew says so much about the law. And there he means the extremes of where anything goes on the one hand, antinomianism. We said how it seems like Matthew's trying to show Jesus striking that balance between antinomianism where anything goes, but then on the other extreme, a legalism that results in a divisiveness over every issue. That's what he means, I think, by sectarianism. Whatever, wherever the church feels drawn to accommodations with forces that oppose the gospel, because Matthew talks about persecution uh, quite a bit. Jesus tells the disciples they'll be persecuted. John does that as well. Wherever the church loses its vision of worldwide evangelism, wherever the church lapses into smug religiosity with, a, with its attendant vices of ostentation, hypocrisy, and haughty disdain for its underprivileged and correspondingly zealous members. There, the Gospel of Matthew speaks with power and pertinence. That might not strike you as profound as it did me, but I thought um, he's right though. So many issues we face in the church and in our own struggle with understanding God's law and understanding uh, the teaching of Jesus and how, how we should value it and, and understand it and apply it in our lives. There's so much that Matthew uh, is, will, will 
help us with. There's so much through which God speaks to us in this great gospel. Uh, any thoughts or comments then before we leave that? I'm going to exit out and you've got a thought. So we can now sound the trumpet and start the book of Luke. I have been studying for weeks now getting ready for this and I uh, just absolutely love Luke. If I could only study one gospel with you, I think it would be the gospel of Luke and really Luke acts together. Uh, I, I, I do love John and you remember Matthew is a favorite of the early church and Matthew has been extremely influential in church history. But John is one that is a favorite today. I think generally among professed Christians, John is the preferred or the, the gospel people will identify the most as their favorite. But there's just something wonderful about Luke's writings here in Luke and Acts. Something so tremendously profound and inspiring and encouraging. I just love the themes. When we get to some of these themes and literary features, Luke is just a tremendous literary work on so many levels. So I'm very excited about, about this. And I want, I want you to be excited. I command, I insist, I demand that you be excited. Kay, are you excited? I'm not feeling it. I'm not feeling it, Kay. Let me, there. All right, that's better. All right. It's Sunday morning. And, you know, for those who might be watching later, or my, maybe my great-grandchildren years from now. It's, it's daylight savings. It's daylight suffering time. We've turned the clocks ahead. We lost an hour, and you can't see what I'm seeing, but almost everyone is stone-cold asleep right now in the class. So <laughs> there's a few people awake, and then the heat, the heat came on. I'm starting to sweat like Mike Tyson at a spelling bee. It's really getting rough in here. <laughs> what? Uh, yeah. Well, I know. Well, it's going to be a raging inferno here soon. All right. So you remember, you remember, we said, uh, Michael, could you get the front two lights again, just for these images for a couple minutes here? This is just. Uh, I think it's fun to look at some of these images. But you remember, we said in church history, even though I'm not saying this is a, this is something grounded in in scripture, but in church history, the four evangelists were associated with the four living creatures from Ezekiel's vision that come up in the throne scene in the book of Revelation in Revelation chapters four and five. And so Matthew, we pointed out, you can see in this image, let's see, Matthew, we pointed out, is associated with the, the image of the man, which you will frequently see uh, as with the wings. And um, Mark with the lion. So the man meaning the Messiah and the lion meaning the kingly. Now this isn't a, the emphasis I would necessarily say is key to each gospel, but this is how they were thought of. And so presenting Christ as the, as the king, the royal uh, Messiah, I think that would fit better with Matthew, frankly. But in, and then Luke is the ox you can see here as presenting the sacrifice as Christ as the, uh, the perfect sacrifice for sin. And then we pointed out John soars above them all. John's the, the eagle, the lofty, the highly theological approach to the Gospels that you see in John is well depicted then, I think, by the eagle. So you'll, you'll frequently see these creatures associated with the, the four Gospels. And so there you see Luke and the, the ox. Here are a couple of more uh, images here. You can see, uh, let me just uh, let you look at that for a second. You see um, the, the four evangelists and the four images, and, um, or the four, four creatures. And here you see the ox again. Some people might not notice that or just might wonder what it is. And so you, uh, you understand what it is. Now here is a tremendous sculpture from a basilica in Rome. I don't think it's St. Peter's, but do you see the bull or do you see the ox there? 
in the image on the, on the left, you can see the uh, you see the ox there. And I love the posture. I love that he's holding the documents in his hand and the posture with the with the stylus uh, in his hand. And so you can Google and find some uh, really stirring images. This was one of the favorites that I encountered. Um, tremendous uh, piece of art that I'd love to talk just about that, that painting. But I've used these earlier as well. And you remember, of course, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are distinguished from John for their similarities, the synoptic gospels because of, of, of so much that is similar in that word synoptic meaning to see the same. But among the synoptics, we're going we're gonna to find out, though, Luke is like the John of the synoptics. Luke is the most distinctive out of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It, it, that is from the others. So we'll, we'll, be, we'll be talking about, thank you, uh, Michael, we'll be talking about that as we proceed. Now, do you remember? Yes, uh, Mike. Well, that, that's what I'm saying. In church history, that, that connection was made, but I don't see that it's actually a biblical thing, you know, that you go to Scripture and see any indication that that's what God was intending to convey by those creatures. But that it's, it's just interesting that you'll so frequently see them displayed that way. Some of these traditions in church history just persist and, uh, you know, capture the popular imagination of Christians. So. And all those they saw them as wings. Yeah, well, and they are winged creatures in the image, so right, right. But, um, yeah, it's interesting. See how the, there's a, the, in Matthew, there is the, uh, the, the man, but in some of the images, the man is like this little toddler <laughs> creature, which isn't how the, the image presents it there. So, um, but I, I pointed out that the purpose of this study is not for us to go through a chapter-by-chapter -chapter examination of, of Luke, but to give you a good foundation so that when you do study Luke or if you ever teach that gospel, you can come back to this material. We'll have all the boards available for you, and I'll recommend sources as well. And this, I hope, will make us uh, have a deeper understanding of and appreciation for this, uh, this great work that we, we already talked about, uh, how, how excited we are supposed to be about this. So as we always do, let's start with the typical issues. When we pick up a Bible book, we want to understand something about its canonical context, where it fits in the, in the Bible story, which we've done as we talked about the place of the Gospels in Scripture and their significance, their importance. But now for this individual gospel. We want to look at its historical context, and I started with Matthew. I want to do this with Luke as well, looking at the importance of this and the popularity of Luke. Um, have you ever heard of the Jesus film? The Jesus film. It's hard to see uh, some of these images. I think this is my last image for a while. Um, the, uh, the, the Jesus film is a film uh, about the life of Christ that has been translated, this is the kind of influence this film has had, it's been translated into over 1,300 different languages, okay? And it has been shown to large groups of people around the world, and it's been seen actually by billions of people. So think about, think about this. And it's, it's available to rent or buy you can stream it. I don't know how this, uh, if, if the, those who hold the copyright to it are allowing it to be available for free, but you can go to YouTube and watch it for free, and it's, uh, it's very interesting. You might compare it to the way you visualize the things in the life of Christ. But the Jesus film, most films and dramatic treatments of the life of Christ are generally taken from Mark, although sometimes you'll see a lot from Matthew but this is based on the book of Luke. So they take the viewer through the story of Christ as God presented it through Luke. And so, so that means, think about it, billions of people have seen the story that Luke wrote about 
Jesus in our day, in modern times, much less through the influence it's had through uh, church history. Well, think about its place in, in Scripture. 14% of the New Testament is, is the book of Luke. That's 10% longer than the next uh, closest book, the book of Acts, which is also a part of Luke's work here. When you, when you put the two combined, Luke-Acts, which are really uh, intended to be one volume, it's over a fourth of the whole New Testament. So in other words, God used Luke to write. He is the writer who has written more than any other New Testament writer to give us our, our New Testaments, the, uh, the one through whom God has given us. Can, I mean, think of that. 27% of the New Testament. So Luke, you know, Luke, Paul, and John make up the majority of the, the New Testament documents. So, yes, uh, Erwin. Well, we're going to talk the, about on authorship, he was not an eyewitness, right? He's a second-generation Christian. So that makes uh, this very interesting um, to, to look at. Now, Mark may have been, Mark may be depicting himself as the, in Mark 15 as the young man who ran away, an uh, odd reference to the young man who runs away at the crucifixion scene. But uh, Luke makes it clear that he was not there. He was not an eyewitness. He interviewed those who were eyewitnesses. So, but, but why would that be a problem, see? Why, unless you're thinking that the Gospels were intended to be first-hand eyewitness accounts. Now they are, John keeps saying in his Gospel, I have seen these things, and so I know they're true. But Luke interviewed those who saw them. See that, I think that's showing us the reliability of reported eyewitness testimony when it's been carefully uh, investigated that it doesn't have to just be an eyewitness telling it to you but eyewitness testimony can be preserved and handed down that's what our Bibles are right preserved testimony that has been handed down to us by God so uh, we weren't there we didn't see it but we can be sure that's what Luke says when he starts his gospel. I, I made sure I researched everything so you can know the certainty of these things. So that, that's what I point him to is the prologue. Let's see uh, if we, we get to that. Here's some reasons why uh, Luke, I think, is, uh, is popular. It's highly readable because Luke is such a tremendous author. It's highly engaging. He writes in very elegant Greek, right? Rose, uh, Rose just picks up her Greek New Testament and reads through the Gospel of Luke, and is, she keeps telling me how she impressed she is with the, uh, with the elegance of Luke's Greek. But it's obviously he was a talented writer. God utilized this man, and the Holy Spirit guided him and superintended what he wrote so that the final product is the Word of God as God wants us to have it, but he used this highly talented, highly educated individual. But Luke's gospel emphasizes the universal nature of the gospel even more so, I think, than Matthew. Although Matthew gives us clues to the inclusion of the Gentiles, we talked about that. But Luke's gospel really emphasizes that, and so obviously it would have a, a universal appeal, but also because there, this is the gospel that puts such special attention on Jesus' concern for the marginalized, the downcast, the outcast, like uh, those at the, the edges of society, the, the sinful woman who anoints him in Simon's house, the, uh, the, the, the poor, the, those women, those who are of low status get special attention in Luke's gospel, so you can see why obviously that would be uh, uh, of great appeal. I gave you a quote from Ernest Renan, the 19th century Bible scholar about Matthew, and what he said about Luke is he considers it the most beautiful book ever written. I think that's a, an interesting quote, uh, an interesting thing to say about that gospel. Well, what are some of the, the well-known and beloved texts from the, the book of Luke that make it a, a popular work with many. Well, it's the, it's the gospel that has the birth narratives that focus on Mary. 
And, and that's why, by the way, our Catholic friends give Luke's birth narrative so much attention. Matthew's deal with Joseph, and in, it's in Luke that there's so much said about Mary. Now, there, of course, we would, we would consider their emphasis on Mary to be unbiblical, uh, gro grossly exaggerated, and um, in fact, I, I, I would refer to it, and no disrespect to our Catholic friends and, and their convictions, uh, as, as Mariolatry, as, a, as a, an unbiblical adoration of Mary that's not justified by what the Scripture says about her. But it's the Gospel that says so much about Mary, about the angels and the shepherds, angels announcing to the shepherds at the birth of Christ and the manger scene. But, but some of Jesus' most famous stories are in Luke, the Good Samaritan, the prodigal son. It's the gospel that tells us about Jesus as a boy, the only reference we have to his boyhood. That's in, the, in Luke's gospel. The, the wealthy chief tax collector, Zacchaeus, do you know Zacchaeus was a, was a wee little man, and a, uh, a wee little man was he. Um, it's the gospel that tells us about the thief on the cross. One of my favorite stories in all the Bible, the road Jesus walked with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus that didn't know it was Jesus until, he, until right before he disappeared from their sight. That is such a powerful uh, story that it's very important. We'll, we'll go over the L material later, the things that are unique to Luke's gospel, but Olivia, uh, our note takers, go ahead and write those down really quickly. There they are. Okay, we need to move on. But now, uh, we're, we're getting to that authorship part. We're, we're looking at, in the historical context, you know, who wrote it, when was it written, from where was it written, to whom was it written, why was it written. So we go through these questions before we get to some of the characteristics of it, and then the, the literary features, the themes and theology and the Christology and all of that. But this is the only gospel that specifies a recipient where he begins by addressing in Luke 1, 1 through 4, that little paragraph is called the prologue to Luke. And so he introduces it as a work that is addressed to Theophilus. And so is the beginning of the the book of Acts, which is Luke part two. I'm going to keep talking about Luke Acts. We're going to examine the theology of Luke Acts, the literary features of Luke Acts, because to understand the theology of Luke, we need to look at how he interprets what happens in Luke by telling us what happened after Jesus ascended in the book of Acts. He tells us what's happening in Acts is the continuation of what Jesus started to do in his own ministry and in his own life and death. So notice in verse 3, he's writing to most excellent Theophilus. And then in th down below, I have the beginning of the book of Acts. And he says, oh, uh, in this first book, oh, Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus, that's what the point I was making there, began to do and teach. So he writes part two to say, now, in that first book, I told you what he started to do. Now when we talk about the church, I'm going to show you what he continued to do. That's very important to understand Luke's unique emphases. So that word, you've often heard it pointed out, that, that term Theophilus means lover of God. So some people say, well, that's just some way of saying that Luke's writing this gospel to all people everywhere who love God, any lovers of God. And so he takes that and, and, and takes that name to just sort of be a generic reference to lovers of God. Uh, I think it's more likely a specific individual. He's called most excellent, and that suggests someone of high social or political status, and maybe even a Roman official. Official, Some speculate that that's why Luke goes to such pains in his gospel. His is the only one where, where Pilate explicitly pronounces Jesus innocent. And in Acts, he frequently shows how when the Jews are persecuting Paul, he frequently shows how the Roman officials have no problem with Paul. How the Roman officials, when the Jews try to instigate the Roman authorities against them, that the Roman authorities again and again uh, pronounce Paul innocent, trying to show, perhaps Theophilus, a Roman official, that the Roman government has nothing to fear from the preaching of the gospel or from the church. That's a very real possibility of why Luke is, has the emphases he does along that line. But 
likely he's a, a wealthy patron who financed the book, the writing of the book of Luke, and so it starts with a dedication to him, which was typically done when someone would finance the production of a book. You remember, this is a, a laborious, long-term, expensive affair to write a book, to write a book, right? You know, authors today get advances from publishers, right? Even today, but think of it in the, in the ancient world. So the, it's the only gospel that addresses a specific individual, but obviously God's speaking to you and to me through this great work as well. So we're, we're going to talk a lot about, be, let me just say this and we're done. When we think of the author of the book of Luke, it really makes a powerful impression on, on us because, because of the way it relates to the theology of Luke. Because he seems to be someone who was part of the social elite. Well-educated, he knows Hebrew sources, he knows Greek sources, he knows Roman sources, and yet here this this person from the elite of society writes the gospel that says the most about how we need to ignore those that social strata and reach across those barriers and treat those who are in the of the lower classes with the same love and concern that God has for everybody see when you understand something about who wrote it it can open up a whole new dimension of appreciation for its themes right Right? So that's why we're going to look at that. Uh, that's why that's important. So thank you for your good attention. I am excited. Did I mention that? That I'm excited about going through the, the book of Luke. So we did 10 for Matthew. We'll see if we can get this done. Uh, in, uh, and we'll try, we'll try to tighten this up and see if I can. I'm still learning, still working on uh, this material. So we'll see if we can um, cover it. Get it covered in less time.